Welcome back to the Faith of the Fathers podcast. I'm your host, Carl Gessler, here to reignite the faith of our fathers. And I want to know today, what do you expose your children to? Years ago, I was uh, hanging out with friends. I was probably around 20. Uh, we were all a bunch of Christian folks, and um, we went back to our friend's house afterwards just to hang out. I don't remember what we were doing that day. Uh, it was Saturday evening, I think, and uh, so they wanted to watch a movie. And started watching this movie, and I was raised um, in a homeschool house. Uh, some people would call it sheltered, uh, and I would say, yes, sheltered, but it was sheltered from the right things. I was not raised naive. My dad talked to me about life uh, in ways that men have told me since that they wish that their dad had talked to them the way my dad did about sex, about government, about, you know, just about life, about reality. So we're watching this movie and uh, just the beginning of the movie starts. I have no idea what the movie was about. Um, I mean, what the movie was called, but the movie starts with people who are rappelling on a rock. It's a father and I think a son and a daughter and they fall and they're in this precarious situation and the father um, the father is at the end of the line. So they're hanging from the cliff uh, with no real way to get up because they're, they're, they weigh too much. So the father says he has to cut himself off uh, and so to save his kids' lives. And his kids are screaming at him not to do it and they watch him cut off the rope and then he bounces off the rocks below. There's a lot of swearing, a lot of uh, screaming, and I was absolutely repulsed. Um, and of course, I got a lot of my Christian friends at that time mad at me because they wanted to enjoy this movie. Uh, to me, it's absurd that we would get, get together on a Saturday night, pop some popcorn and watch a traumatic an event unfold before us on purpose. And it's not even real. So I've, I've always been very sensitive to violence in, in uh, movies and, uh, you know, the sexual nature. I mean, in this movie, too, people don't even bat an eye up at this, but I do, uh, and you should, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, there, you know, part of the movie involved a, a woman who's, um, you know, the, the daughter in this scene uh, is wearing something like a sports bra, and uh, you can see right down her chest from the angle, like the, the way it was filmed, all of that stuff, you know, people, people don't even bat an eye at that. And to me, I, you know, I'm a 20 year old guy. Uh, and I'm just like, I, I shouldn't be looking at this. I don't want to be looking at this. I'm not going to look at this. And so the whole thing, it was like an exposure to something totally unnecessary, all for the sake of entertainment. Um, and meanwhile, as someone who have volunteered with the Voice of the Martyrs for many years, um, I would go around to different churches uh, speaking and exposing people in the Western church to the reality of persecution in the world uh, to our brothers and sisters around the world. And the Voice of the Martyrs every year puts out a, a short video uh, that is just powerful and it, it exposes people to the reality of what other Christians are experiencing around the world. And one video that I had um, in a year when we were involved at a uh, mainline denomination church was uh, about a church in Africa that in the middle of worship was uh, some Muslim men came and just shot uh, bullets through the church from, from the outside. They just came with machine guns and just just shot and a bunch of people died. Um, and they did a reenactment of it for this video. And I wanted to show it for our, uh, for the church service for the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, which is usually in early November. And I was told that um, we weren't going to do that because there were kids, people might be offended, um, yada, yada, yada. And it just made me so mad because kids are exposed to all sorts of perversion and nastiness. I mean, uh, just going to public school, your kids are being exposed to porn these days, literally porn, as part of their education. Uh, so, I, so, you know, like, that's such a garbage argument uh, that, you know, people are going to be offended. And maybe they will be, but for goodness sake, they should be. You know, it's, it's, it's really sad when uh, we're too afraid to be offended in church. Meanwhile, our brothers and sisters aren't watching videos of being shot. They actually are being shot in places uh, like Africa, China, the Middle East, North Korea, all over the world, Colombia. 
you know, and it's in a, we're being persecuted here in the United States. And this is one of the reasons it's important to expose our children to the right kind of things. You know, there, there's a purpose in exposing our kids to the right kind of violence in the sense of the right kind of exposure to violence. Um, and it should be the kind that educates them about the reality of the world we live in and pro- helps them to get themselves ready to know where they're going to draw the line, where they're going to take a stand. And so um, I believe in exposing my kids to the realities of the world, the realities of witchcraft, the realities of uh, what other people experience. You know, my wife and I meet many people, we hear their stories, and many people have very heartbreaking stories, and our kids um, are privy to a lot of those conversations. Um, and we we walk with them through those things. We help them process them. I'm not saying we do it perfectly. My wife and I oftentimes uh, disagree at, at to the level of exposure um, that our kids should have. Uh, but I am a firm believer that exposing our kids to the reality of the world uh, that we live in is very helpful to them, as long as we're there to help them process it. So that's why I take my kids to these college campuses to uh, when we do the Genocide Awareness Projects, which are um, projects created by the Center for Bioethical Reform, uh, by um, started by a name, man named Greg Cunningham, who used to be a congressman. And we use graphic images of abortion, graphic images of Rwanda, uh, and uh, the Holocaust, and blacks being lynched in the South. And we show how uh, the arguments used to justify those heinous crimes are being used to justify the violence done against children in the womb today. That Abortion is another form of genocide. It's very powerful, very effective, very graphic. So I brought my kids with me uh, to App State in Boone, North Carolina, and Johnson City, uh, East State, Tennessee, East Tennessee State University in Johnson City. And I want you to hear today, I, I took a few minutes to interview my son Justice, after um, our time there, and I want you to hear what he has to say about it. Um, but while we were there, we also took um, our friends, or my kids' friends, um, Isaac and Sabina, along with us. Uh, and while we were still on the campus, I got a hot take of Isaac. Just I wanted to hear what he had to say, uh, so I pulled out my camera, uh, my phone, and I uh, just want to share that with you. And then um, I want to share with you what Justice had to say um, in our little post um, post campus ministry conversation. That was her 12th time in this, like, uh, that was her 12th time saying that she doesn't want to own her on campus in the past two hours, right? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say it was more than 12. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, like 32. I started total. counting, yeah. Like she like, kind of slowed down though. Oh yeah, it's about 32 total. Was it, was oh, it like, more intense or less intense than you expected? Uh, I say a little bit more because I was expecting it to be more like a I don't know, more of a calm, semi-formal debate without loud music or megaphones. <laughs> Maybe where they wanted to hear your viewpoint and they respectfully <laughs> answered. That's what I was expecting. <laughs> wow. That's, that's not what happened, Isaac? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? It was, it was a one-way conversation. Yeah, with a <laughs> megaphone. With <laughs> a megaphone, if, yeah. If you have to use a mega, megaphone, you're not good at listening. It's true. They couldn't win by reason, so they had to win by volume. All right, so in the studio with me is a very special guest. They could hardly get more specialer. Yes. My son, Justice Gessler. Welcome back to the podcast, Justice. Hi. How old are you now? Uh, I'm not asking. I'm just, yeah, I forgot. Uh, so you are the this oldest. Many. This many. Yeah. So three plus ten, that equals thirteen. Justice is thirteen. You're the oldest of six kids, um, and your dad doesn't let you watch too many movies, does he? Um. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um. No, I'm not big on sore subject. <laughs> but dad does take you to college campuses where you see graphic images of abortions. Is that true or is that not true? I've heard rumors. That's true. Yeah. The first time you did it, what, you were maybe nine or ten? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think I was more like ten, but yeah. Do you remember what it felt like or, you know, what, what did you experience the first time you saw those pictures? Um, I guess I was just 
kind of grossed out, but it kind of it kind of took me a little while to comprehend. Mm. To comprehend like what they were, I just knew they were like gross. Like uh, when you say a little while, you mean like a few hours that day, or like here we are three or four years um, later, and you're you just realized that those are pictures of babies. I mean, I guess like the first time, I was just kind of like. Yeah, I mean, they're gross, and I, I was, I, w I don't think I was traumatized by the pictures, but um, I just thought they were really, really gross. So, you've come back with me uh, several times on to these college campuses. Why do you, why do you come back? Um, well, I think it's important to do, uh... It's, I mean, if me going there one day could save the life of one baby, then it's worth it. Well, that's a cool answer. Uh, have you ever been traumatized on college campuses? Yeah. Okay, can you tell, me what, tell me what they were, because I've never, you know, never had this conversation directly about that. What, what kind of things stand out to your mind as <sighs> like, hey, that was scary, or that was horrible, or? Um, I mean, the most traumatic thing is just, the, the protesters coming up against us. It's like, yeah, they're, that's the most, that's the most traumatic part. So what, what is traumatic about it? What, what is it that bothers you about the way they, well, about them? Sometimes it's like, sometimes I think they like might be possessed by demons. Other times they're just like filled with rage and screaming. So are you afraid you're going to get hurt or you're afraid that I'm going to get hurt? No, it's just, uh, it's just, I don't know. Let me try that again. Uh, uh, I don't know, it's just, like, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, how about, is it, it's unsettling because, uh, because they're just acting, I mean, they're, they're screaming curses at us all day long. Mm -hmm. Uh. And that that yeah, does take a toll just, on the soul. It just disturbs me when people, yeah, screaming and probably just by demons and just acting really outrageous. Hmm. So, what do you what do you feel toward those people? You know, like when you think back on this past uh, our recent trip, when you think back of the protesters, that guy that was screaming in my face, the the um, the girl screaming into the megaphone all day what is your thought toward them um well my first thought is kind of like shock towards them like what's wrong with you <laughs> and then my second is like anger like stop screaming at us like ridiculously and then third is probably just Still being angry, but also just feeling sorry for them. Like, to, like, they must be miserable to act like that. Yeah. I think you're right. I think they are miserable. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, my last question. Well, maybe two. You you had friends come with you on this last trip. We had friends come with you. Yep. Did that help? Um, I mean, I guess it... It helped uh, me be less, well, we had more people come that time. We had some students come out and help, and that was nice. From uh, the college. I felt, yeah. yeah, I felt safer. I felt more backed up, um, but also just the car ride and stuff was more fun. Okay, so um, to all those 13-year-olds out there, uh, would you recommend to them that they go to these events with, with their dad? or You can somebody? get a free autograph if you come. A free autograph? Oh, you mean from you? Yeah. That's quite duh. an offer. Well, what if they're not? What if you're not there? Like just in general, you're going to a campus. They can like touch the seat where I sat. Okay. Well, let's try to move <laughs> on from you, and <laughs> let's just talk about you know like the just the idea of going to college campuses to do this pro-life work, knowing you're going to get screamed at, knowing you're going to be threatened, knowing it's going to be <sighs> intense. Do you? Uh, do you think it's good for other people, other um, kids your age, young adults, to experience that? 
Um, I don't know. It just really depends on who you are, but, um, I mean, it's like, I think, I think, I don't, I don't know about other people, but I think for me it was, it was good just to, like, realize that we're in a war. <laughs> like before, it's like, all people are like, we're in spiritual warfare. Mm. But now it's like. Spiritual warfare, you know, like up in your face, and it's young people. Right, right, yeah, that does make sense, I, and I appreciate that. So, so I have another question: Does it make you want to go to college? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think the protesters convinced me abortion was wrong more than like the pictures. Ah, oh, interesting. Just yeah, I like, can see that. Yeah, just they're on. I don't. Yeah, I don't want to be like that. <laughs> That's good, good advice. Well, thank you, Justice. Do you have anything else to share? Are you ready to go? Uh, you want to go eat breakfast? I have lots to share about me. Okay, I so guess I it's time. Probably go, yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for being with us. Sure. Innocence is a very powerful thing. Naivete is also a very powerful thing, but in a negative way. We do not want our kids to be naive about the world. We want them to be innocent. And my daughter Carly, who just turned 12, was also with us on the college campus. And her innocence really spoke volumes. Uh, there was a young lady who came up to me with a question that I get very regularly. Um, I was standing by myself and she came up and said, she asked me if I had a daughter. And she said, if your daughter, uh, you know, if your 12 year old daughter was raped, uh, would you force her to have that child? And I've answered this question many times, and it's not that hard to answer, but I wanted to get kind of a, another a hot take from, a, from um, someone who actually is a 12-year-old. And Carly and I had never, you know, we didn't pre-plan this conversation. We didn't have this conversation beforehand. I just called her over. I said, Carly, uh, I, I introduced her to this young lady. I said, this is my daughter. She's 12. Um, and I said, Carly, if you were forcibly made pregnant by a man, and, and for some reason... I couldn't say rape just because I don't even want to speak that word over my daughter. Um, and, I, you know, in no way in these conversations do I ever belittle the, the violence of rape, the, the violation that it is, uh, the wickedness that it is. Um, but I always argue, of course, that it's not the baby's fault and it will only be a second trauma to you, uh, the woman, to, uh, to abort or to kill your child after a rape, you'll have trauma on, on top of trauma, which isn't going to do you any good. Um, and obviously it's not going to do the child any good. But I asked Carly, so Carly, if a man forcibly got you pregnant, would you want to have that child? And she immediately answered, yes. And this young lady, a little surprised, was like, why? And um, Carly just quickly answered, because I love babies. And this college student just looked cockeyed at her and had no idea really how to respond to that. I think she was not prepared for that, for this scenario to take place. I think she came up to me just assuming that I was a um, domineering, controlling, uh, white Christian male uh, that, um, it, that only cares about imposing my will on people. Uh, and so to hear Carly just say, well, I'd do it because I'd want to have the baby because I love babies. She just wasn't prepared for that. And I would, I would uh, easily, I mean, I, this, this is not even a risk to just make this assumption. This, this girl's experience in childhood is very different. It had to be very different than Carly's experience in childhood because Carly wants to repeat life. Carly wants to uh, have children because she has enjoyed her childhood. Um, Dr. Cashin, Dr. David Cashin was a man I met several years back, and he made a profound statement saying that if you enjoyed your childhood, uh, if you liked your childhood, you're going to want to repeat it. You're most likely going to want to repeat it. And if you didn't, you're most likely going to not want to repeat it. Makes sense. And, uh, you know, all of the protesters, all these y mostly young women and some men that were uh, protesting our display there, um, many of them were telling us about their miserable childhoods through a megaphone. You know, we would have been glad to talk with them to help them walk through that pain and suffering if they would put their megaphone down long enough, but they would shout at us that uh, through a megaphone that we don't want to have a conversation, and then they would never stop. And I, I offered to take the megaphone at one time, which they 
um, turned me down. So I guess they didn't really want to have a conversation. But if they did, we could talk through some of that trauma. We could pray through it and they would get deliverance. And we do have that happen. Many of these protesters, after they get tired of yelling and shouting at us and um, us still being there, they decide to come over and talk to us instead. And we have very profound conversations. Many times uh, these folks will end up thanking us um, after the conversation. People who were screaming at us just a few minutes before they end up thanking us. So, um, you know, the power of love, the power of God's love is is the greatest power in the world. And we need to not forget that. But we also need to remember that those who are those who are opposing us have been exposed to violence in the wrong kind of way. I mean, you know, in God's perfect will on earth, the all violence, it will eventually be gone. You know, that is every tear will be wiped away. But we live in a world where evil is a reality and violence is a ra- reality. Um, evil is a reality that we need to expose our kids to so they can be prepared so that they'll know the importance of of grounding themselves in the Word of God, of having Christian friends, of meditating on on Jesus day and night, singing songs to Him, you know, worship, all these things. We need them equipped. When when your kids are exposed to evil, as Justice mentioned, you know, he said that the the protesters convinced him more of the evil of abortion than the pictures, uh, and he, which I think in part partially is because he, as a child, he didn't fully comprehend the pictures because he's he's done this for a few years now, but. Um, when you see evil on display, people acting in uh, crazy ways. I mean, one lady who could have been a 30-year-old mom, I, I'm, it was hard to tell, but she just came over and had literally said no words. She just ran up to our display, screamed her head off, took a deep breath and did it again. And that was all she said. You know, and kids see that and they're just like, whoo, I'm just glad that that lady is not my mom. You know, and you see, you see uh, evil on display and you realize the importance of clinging to the things that are good. Uh, But many of these kids that were protesting us, I'm sure, have been exposed to evil because evil has been done to them. And many of us uh, Christians have foolishly exposed ourselves to evil in the form of entertainment. I mean, we are not meant to watch uh, someone's dad bounce off rocks, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. We're not meant to see a scene like that while eating popcorn. I mean, God didn't design us to see a scene like that at all. It's only because evil is in the world that we see it. And people will say, well, you know, this movie depicts the reality of evil in the world. Well, you know what? There are actual things of evil in the world that you could expose yourself to, things that you could actually learn to respond to, that Christ has commissioned you to be an agent of healing. You know, that's what he sent us out to do, cast out demons and heal the sick, uh, raise the dead. You know, um, we aren't supposed to be naive about evil. We're not supposed to make it entertainment. We're supposed to make it uh, the, our the target in our crosshairs. You know, as we live our lives, we are supposed to be warriors for God's kingdom, uh, locating evil and then destroying it by the power of God's love and through the power of the cross and resurrection of Jesus. So, you know, if you um, if you haven't yet exposed your kids to these things, I say first, expose yourself to them so that you can learn to process, you know, the reality of evil, the reality of abortion, um, and then expose it to your kids. And as uh, if you also are suffering from trauma, maybe you've had an abortion, maybe uh, you were violated, maybe you were raped, maybe um, maybe someone molested you, you know, uh, you need to get healing for that. And the, the best way to do that is to talk to Jesus, talk to him honestly. Uh, and ask him to take uh, to take your pain, uh, to heal the wounds in your soul. Uh, and we've talked about that on the podcast uh, several times. And it's going to be something we'll just have to continue to do because it is our uh, the center part of our ministry. You know that um, if you are guilty of any sin like abortion, you need to just confess that to the Lord um, and know that. Uh, if we confess our sins to the Lord, he is faithful and just to, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Um, and so he is not afraid. He already knows of your sin and he has already forgiven you. And all you need to do is confess it and receive what's already been given. Um, Jesus is not surprised by your sin. And uh, the Bible says that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And while we were enemies of God, he reconciled us to himself. 
So uh, don't be afraid. You know, if you if you have things that you have done um, and you're afraid of people knowing what they are, you need to let that go and first confess to Jesus what you have done. He's going to carry away your shame. He's going to carry away your guilt and you're going to be free. Um, and it's time to expose the things done in darkness to the light so that it can be washed away. That's the main uh, our main task in this world, and it begins with us. Lord, send revival. Start with me. Let's confess our sins to one another uh, and to the Lord that we might be healed. And then let's help our kids learn to process evil so they can be equipped to resist it and to stand against it. All right, thanks for being with me today. God, I hope this is an encouragement to you. And if you would take a, mo- a moment to encourage me by rating and reviewing the podcast, liking it, leaving a comment below, sharing it with a friend. Um, and if you'd like to support uh, my ministry, there are links below in every podcast episode. All right. God bless you guys. And I will see you next time.